Well, let me start by thanking um, uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Heal here for inviting me because this is a very different kind of conference than I typically uh, speak at. So I, uh, I've actually already learned a lot. It's been very, very interesting today. Um, so let me start with a, a quick introduction of what it is that we do at MSCI to give you some background for why I'm particularly focused uh, on the issue of data quality and scalability. Um, and then I wanted to give all of you a brief overview of how different types of uh, climate metrics have been developed uh, to meet the different dimensions of climate exposure that institutional investors are trying to measure and monitor today. Um, and then the second half of um, my time, I think I'm going to focus on two of the most fundamental inputs that go into generating these climate metrics, uh, which are company emissions data, which has been mentioned a few times already this morning, um, and company asset locations. Um, and how new techniques, I think, are, are being applied to improve these data inputs that really need quite a lot of improvement. Um, so my key message for all of you that is that, you know, despite a lot of the advances that we're seeing today, you know, at this conference and elsewhere, are producing ever more sophisticated climate analytics, certainly for, for, finance, for the use for finance and investments, you know, researchers and capital allocators, I think, still really need to pay the most attention to the quality of these primary base layer data that are really actually quite foundational inputs into any kind of climate risk analysis. So, um, MSCI. Let's see. OK. All right. We're a financial services company, probably best known for being the largest equity index provider in the world. There are over $13 trillion of assets benchmarked to MSCI's indexes. Um, but indexes isn't why I'm speaking to you today. I'm here because um, I've spent over a decade um, at MSCI growing a unit that has become the world's largest provider of any type of environmental, social, and governance data, uh, ratings, and models to the global investment industry. Um, our clients are institutional investors. Uh, that includes the majority of the world's largest uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, investment managers. Um, they use a very wide variety of ESG and climate risk inputs from us into their investment processes, and they do them in all very different ways. Um, so MSCI has been a very strong proponent um, that the providers of uh, private capital really need to be at the forefront of the net zero revolution. You know, we do think that the economy-wide transition will be smoother and will present fewer financial risks if um, capital markets participants can actually infuse their capital allocation um, decisions with a view to climate risks and opportunities. And, you know, you... You will have heard, you know, maybe from some of the previous speakers and, and elsewhere in the news that, you know, many of the world's leading financial institutions really have been taking climate risks seriously. Um, and some of them are really setting examples for, for, for providing, you know, this a level of public transparency that is important. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, the world's largest pension fund, uh, which is the government pension investment fund in Japan, with over one, uh, $1.4 trillion in assets, um, it has been publishing estimated values for their portfolios under a three-degree scenario versus a 1.5-degree warming scenario. Um, here in the U.S., um, the California's uh, pension fund, um, uh, CalPERS, with roughly $450 billion in assets, has also been reporting on potential drag on their future returns under different climate scenarios. Now, this type of reporting you start to see is actually extremely challenging because these are very, very large investors. They have extremely diversified portfolios with many, many different asset classes that are managed um, across multiple investment mandates. So to actually get a total portfolio view is actually you require consistent metrics that can cover tens of thousands of companies globally and millions of financial instruments. Um, and that's why, you know, at MSCI, we care so much about the scalability and the comparability of any metric that we're developing. Um, using local regional models, for example, may not actually scale appropriately to enable us to be able to get an aggregated, you know, total portfolio um, view. Um, so people often ask me, you know, what, what climate metrics do, you, do um, investors actually use to measure their portfolios, climate-related or climate risk exposures? Um, and I really don't have a one-word answer because our climate metrics data set that investors use actually have over 900 metrics, um, and they're really measuring different dimensions of climate risk. Um, but in terms of how we taxonomize this or categorize this, let me just give you a brief overview of how, how it is that investors think about it and how we organize it. So at the highest level, 
Um, institutional investors are typically wanting to understand two different dimensions to climate related characteristics in their portfolios. So on the left hand side, what you see, the questions are really about the companies that you're financing as an investor and what their contribution is to global emissions. Um, and therefore, you know, what's your responsibility, if you will, as a financier of the entities um, generating those emissions. You're typically only uh, owning or, or you are lender to a very small part um, of the, these companies. Um, and then on the right hand side, the questions are how the energy transition and physical risk can impact the value of their portfolios. So whether it's about investments that are impacting world emissions um, on the left-hand side or how climate change will impact portfolio value on the right-hand side, we can also further differentiate between the metrics that we have that take a today snapshot view of the world. So what are the emissions footprints, for example, or the emissions intensity of portfolios today, which, you know, of course, is a backward-looking view because they're emissions that have already been put out um, into the air versus a projected future view. And really, the, the bulk of the analytical firepower, um, I think, in our world, and, and certainly in terms of climate risk modeling at MSCI, is um, really focused on developing these forward-looking metrics. So one forward-looking metric that the team works on, just as an example, is an implied temperature rise metric. And it's, an, it's a metric that's expressed in degrees Celsius. Um, and it compares a company's projected um, total emissions over the next 50 years against its company-specific fair share carbon budget uh, for staying well under um, two degrees. And so the extent to which a company overshoots or undershoots um, its allocated budget is then converted to an implied global temperature rise, meaning you know, how, how much warmer would the world be if the entire economy were to overshoot or undershoot the budget to the same extent as this one company. So that's just one example. And then on the right-hand side, um, you know, we have very different dedicated teams that are working on components are, of our um, climate value at risk model. Um, it provides measures of potential valuation changes uh, for the assets in a portfolio under different climate scenarios. And it's very important to institutional investors to have these um, scenarios be aligned with um, standardized scenarios that are now coming out, uh, for example, from the NGFS, which is the Network for Greening the Financial system and with the IPCC. For reporting purposes, I think having reference scenarios that are standardized are extremely important um, innovation, really, in, in this market. Um, the physical risk model, you know, for example, does actually measure and then aggregate companies' exposure um, to 10 extreme and gradual uh, climate-related weather events. So, you know, these, these models are becoming more and more specialized, you know, for, for investor use. <laughs> Now, even though we all like to talk about the most sophisticated forward-looking models that everyone's working on, I actually want to bring everyone kind of back to the basics. Um, and I want to talk about company emissions because that is such a primary input into the hundreds of climate metrics that are used by investors today and in the financial world. And some of the questions you ask whenever you're looking at any kind of company, company emissions data, and I think there were some shown this morning, is, is that data disclosed? Is that data estimated? And whether it's disclosed or estimated, you know, what is the quality of that data? So what you can see is that you know, more and more companies are reporting on their emissions, as you can see here on the chart for the, the various years. Um, the percentage of companies on MSCI's broadest benchmark of 9,000 um, publicly listed companies globally, you know, it is going up, especially you know, for scope one and two. Um, and I would not. I would probably discount the scope three uh, bar because that's any, any kind of um, any component or uh, category under scope three is counted there. Um, so they're not very comparable. Um, now, despite this increase, um, today we still really only have a little over a third of all companies, publicly listed companies, reporting on their scope one and scope two emissions. And that does mean that the bulk of the emissions that people are using, emissions data that investors are using today, still have to be estimated. So then an important question is then how, how good are these estimates, right? So you're going to have different data providers that are all going to have different um, estimation methodologies. And I think what's really important is that um, there are standards like uh, PCAP, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, that provides a very good standard for at least how you evaluate the different quality levels of the emissions number. So under the PCAP standard, the highest quality is considered to be reported emissions, self company self-reported emissions. And the lowest is when you can only provide an estimate based 
on a company's industry. And then there are quality levels in between. So for example, if you have production-based um, inputs like you know the fuel mix of a power company, then that is, um, a, I think it's a quality level two, and so on and so forth. So it's very important to kind of know what the quality level of the, of the, um, of the data is. Um, but let's talk about reported emissions because even though company self-disclosed data is considered to be of the highest quality under the PCAF standard, um, you know, reported data actually still have to go, quite, uh, go through quite a lot of validation. Um, there is today no mandatory standardized disclosure of emissions for companies. Um, we'll see whether or not regulations might change that. Um, but for a data provider like ourselves at MSCI, you know, we have to find disclosure in all sorts of places, right? It could be companies might put it out on a website. They might put it out in a press release. They might put it out in a CSR report. Uh, they might report it to a third party such as the CDP. Um, and, you know, as the largest consumer of corporate sustainability reporting in the world, um, I can tell you firsthand that where comp where co when companies report to uh, CDP versus where they report to someone else, they often don't match. Okay, so there isn't a single source of truth, um, and there, it requires a lot of, um, a, a lot of validation and, and, and cleaning. And that's why um, when we think about data science or talk about data science at, at MSCI, a lot of the investment is actually simply in trying to identify and extract relevant disclosures from disparate sources in very different formats uh, across, you know, 14,000 companies that we're covering. Um, and then also, more importantly, we're constantly refining our techniques to better detect anomalies and errors. Um, and we have the benefit of, you know, machines being able to learn from the deepest and longest ESG data history out there, as well as having human analysts who are constantly in this feedback loop to, to be able to flag errors and, 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 um, and have this uh, constant kind of learning. And so the nice thing is that, of course, there's huge improvements in, in the data quality for that reason. But the key message to all of you is still that, you know, you should quite question the quality of emissions data. Any emissions data that you're using, you really should be asking kind of where did that come from and was it um, well validated. Um, let me turn to another data input that I do consider to be foundational um, into climate risk analysis, even though um, it's really not climate data per se, and that is the locations of the physical assets that are owned by the thousands of companies in a diversified investment portfolio. Um, so as modeling around physical climate risks improve, you know, there is a lot of excitement about all the improvements that you've seen today, um, resolutions and, and uh, maps and, and, um, and uh, damage functions, you know, being more accurate and so forth. But I think none of those modeling improvements would matter very much um, for a large diversified portfolio if you don't have high quality bottoms up data on the locations of the physical facilities and then very importantly the structural characteristics of those facilities because what you really need to have is to be able to tie it to a company's revenues and their production capacity that is tied to each facility. Um, and that's why, you know, at MSCI, we've also had to invest a lot in building an, an asset location database. Um, this is a spatial um, database of corporate locations. It includes everything from offices to manufacturing sites to power plants. Um, and we currently cover all publicly listed companies across all sectors, but continue to expand. So the collection process to date has actually been quite manual. So we have to comb through a lot of company documents and websites to discover location information. We have to prioritize the collection by infrastructure that have higher value, assets that have a stronger relationship to the core businesses, uh, assets that are less mobile. You know, I'm just saying that you know we're not populating this database with like ATMs and bank branches that don't have have a lot of um, high asset value to the companies. Um, we also bring in data sets, of course, from government um, sources and, and open source data, and we're constantly on the prowl for those that type of information. Um, but I think what's really exciting um, at the moment is I think this process is about to get you know, vastly scaled. Um, we have been building capabilities that include significant investments in our geospatial data processing infrastructure. Uh, I think some people also talked about infrastructure this morning, hugely important for us. You know, earlier in the year, um, we, we, MSA did announce a, a partnership with Google, and, and that's really helping us, you know, access uh, Google's compute capabilities and to develop ways to process this kind of data at scale. Um, you know, deriving physical assets attributes by processing um, different types of data like satellite images and 
and, uh, um, and LIDAR data and surface models and so forth. So really the aim, um, and, and you know, we're very optimistic that you can then quickly increase by you know, 10x to over 10 million physical assets um, in terms of what we can cover in the, in the database. So that's the kind of scalability that, of data that we're really focused on um, and in, in terms of leveraging new technologies. So I think I'm starting to run out of time. I was going to touch on why this foundational nature of the asset location data uh, is going to become even more important as we push out into emerging areas, such as measuring portfolio exposures to different dimensions of biodiversity risks. This is something that is rising on the agenda of a lot of investors. Um, and so here's just one example you know, where we've overlaid the same asset location data that we use for our physical risk modeling that I've just been talking about, but we can overlay it with with um, a map here is um, mean species abundance, which is an indicator of biodiversity intactness. Um, and there's a lot more to come in this area. And, and I think you know, we're very excited to be focusing on leveraging more of this kind of geospatial data in novel ways uh, for portfolio level measurement. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, I just want to emphasize that clearly, I think, you know, our technological capabilities today, you know, collectively, you know, can vastly improve all types of data used to measure climate related risks. Um, I hope, though, that what you've taken away, you know, through my very quick tour of just a few of these metrics is that um, despite all the advances in modeling, the quality of the primary base layer data is still extremely paramount. So if your emissions data is wrong, if your bottoms up data of physical locations is patchy and incomplete, um, I think it just doesn't matter, you know, how sophisticated the layers are that you put on top of it. Um, and so, you know, I, I worry quite a lot because I think very much on this old adage of garbage in, garbage out, it still does apply in our world. So I hope you're going to keep that in mind um, the next time you're looking at your climate data inputs. Thank you.